we hear every day the news that this economy is going fast, this is declining, and all politicians are concerned, oh, we have only 1% growth or we have half percent decline, and it's always measured in GDP, gross domestic product, uh, often also used per capita, but it's more as a type of wealth measure meant. Uh, but uh, this is the, the, most, the most narrow of the three concepts I, I would like to introduce and clarify the relationship. This is just the annual change in the income measured by GDP increase or decrease. You know, we have negative growth <laughs> when we have decrease. Despite all deficiencies of GDP as the indicator uh, uh, of uh, economic growth, this is still the most popular uh, category, most po popular indicator. However, there are efforts, and I'm also a part of this, to substitute it, or at least complement with the other indicators with better uh, inform us about, not only about economic, but about social development. So economic development is very interesting that uh, certain point, President Eisenhower made a big issue of economic development in the late 40s, you know, when he moved beyond the issue of uh, economic growth and then presented larger picture, uh, larger concept uh, defined as a process of uh, securing not only economic wealth, but also quality of life, improving income distribution, improving uh, environmental quality, improving productivity and competitiveness. And then since uh, late 80s, after the famous uh, Brundtland Report, Our Common Future, 1986, we are talking about sustainable development. I will come back to these uh, um, definitions and the relations at my last lecture on Saturday, uh, but uh, I want to emphasize that uh, economic development then is a type of mid-term or long-term talk, you know, about five or ten years time horizon. So, not contrary to annual uh, economic growth, it usually refer. Social development, we, 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 hear, uh, we heard uh, a lot uh, last days, and then uh, I am, as economist, I completely embrace uh, the, the definitions my colleagues presented, and for me, social development is always human-centered uh, development process to, to increase higher standard of life, more empowerment, greater creativity, and higher satisfaction of the resources we have. And so uh, this is larger concept and the, the economic development serves as a resource platform for social development. The issue is how we coordinate the resources and this is the major problem of economics. We have many schools of economics. Uh, from classical economics, uh, which was dealing with uh, uh, efficient allocation of resources to secure the wealth of the nations, to maybe more, much more narrow uh, focus of neoclassical economics, who, uh, which removed uh, certain uh, social aspects to focus, to, to, to be able to apply very quantitative apparatus. 
So uh, if we look at the history uh, of uh, resource allocation, we have uh, two competing models. One by market regulations, by free market, and one by governmental regulations. So the big crisis of late 20s, 30s uh, brought the hot debate among economies, led on one hand by that time, uh, Oscar Lange, who was uh, with the University of Chicago, and uh, who defended, or he maybe not defended, you know, because it was too easy to, because the, the, there was a competing model, Soviet Union already existed, and uh, without this big crisis, there was moving toward centrally planned economies with really, uh, with full power. And then uh, the crisis and free market failure. Uh, but that model of free market was uh, defended mostly by Mises and Hayek. So it was an interesting debate which you see echoes uh, until today. Uh, so government run economy for self-regulation. Of course, Oscar Lange didn't want to, to be fair, uh, didn't want to, to run the economy by the government, but uh, he was able to present the model which those who are teaching uh, comparative economic system, uh, uh, it's called market socialist, socialist market economy, excuse me. Uh, which use the decentralized model of uh, management with the parametric, economic parameters, mostly uh, by price mechanism uh, regulation of the economy. Uh, during that time, in the 30s, there was no clear uh, determined results of this debate who won because it was the lack of mathematical apparatus to quantify and then measure, you know, which system works more efficiently. However, somehow, uh, maybe not student, but the protege of Oscar Lange, who brought him to the United States, Leonid Hurwicz, developed over years the, the concept of decentralized economics. And uh, with his book, uh, Market, uh, Designing Market, uh, Designing Economic Mechanisms, which was type of summary of his work, uh, published in uh, 2005, I believe, which gave him the Nobel Award in Economics, presented clearly that that model which was initiated by Oscar Lange, the type of decentralized but uh, coordinated through economic parameters, could be more efficient in very mathematical terms. So now we have the tools and uh, this particular model is even more attractive. Now if we look from the perspective of the last big financial and economic crisis, 2007, 8, 9, still are Several countries are struggling to, to, to overcome the recession follow the crisis. So anyway, uh, if we look in the extreme forms, central planet economy, uh, the Soviet Union symbolized 70 years experience, huge waste of resources, huge bureaucracy, and uh, human rights abuses, and the free market, which produced cyclical 
the uh, crises and uh, leads to concentrated economic power and then uh, very unfair uh, income distribution. So these two models failed. They didn't uh, respond to, they didn't, none of these models secured smooth economic development or even economic growth. I'm not talking about uh, uh, social development because none of them secured this. So, uh, what are the alternatives? Working uh, after the collapse of the, uh, the communist system, central planet economies, uh, in fact, you know, before even we started working on the, some alternative uh, solution to the situation in Poland, and I was very lucky to uh, be uh, allocated in uh, at the University of uh, Minnesota, where uh, Professor uh, Kurvic was uh, residing, and then uh, preparing the solutions for Poland and the other countries, we did studies and we proposed uh, that uh, we should take into account also the new mode of coordination. In fact, you know, it existed a long time ago, but we didn't have that type of tools, and the economist or sociologist, uh, uh, political scientists were not much interested in that issue in the past, but last 20 years, the issue of network became very popular. So the, the, there is the, the, the third uh, mode of coordination, the networks, which uh, are gaining significance, and they can respond uh, to uh, emerging economic, social, political uh, problems. We saw Arab Spring, you know, that political network mobilized the, 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 the nations and uh, got rid of uh, regimes. But at the same time, you know, we see that uh, the networks fail to sustain the, the results. So somehow studying the network uh, as a social phenomena is a very promising area. And we know the networks are typical phenomena in, uh, in the nature. Our brain is probably the most complex network. And then from that point of view, economists, sociologists, political scientists could learn a lot from uh, natural sciences. So this is another opportunity when uh, we are trying to build transdisciplinary science to learn each other and uh, get inspired. So uh, I, for me, uh, so the, the, the first uh, serious uh, opportunity was the designing uh, institutions for sustainable development. We, we did this exercise in uh, uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria. And it was the time also I learned uh, firsthand from uh, Professor Hurwicz, who introduced me also to another um, Nobel Prize winner, Eleanor uh, Ostrom. Uh, it was the first women who received Nobel uh, Prize in economics. And uh, they represent, uh, because of their openness, they represent uh, significant, that I would say, that the funding fathers of institutional economics, which is departing from neoclassical economics, because neoclassical economics doesn't touch institutions. Institutions are given. And now we are moving to the area, oh, we need to think to reform or design institutions. This is what was the issue when we came 
uh, with the first recommendation to, to Poland and to Central Europe, to the Africa, that the old institutions collapsed, disappeared, and there was a need to build new institutions. So this is why we, we had to learn, and then, then building institutions uh, for sustainability was my task for many years. And recently I am uh, doing uh, research on uh, very important uh, for sustainability type of networks, industrial clusters. And, and then today I, I would like to go quickly to show the power uh, uh, of the networks. I will start with the networks which respond to the market failures, but also to a large extent to government failures that we are not able, I mean, the, the climate uh, change is the phenomenon caused by many reasons, but the major reason is uh, economic. Uh, the, 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 this is uh, Nicholas, uh, uh, the British e economist, uh, okay, uh, the name will come, uh, come later, uh, who prepared the report for the United, uh, United Nations uh, and then uh, described uh, climate change as the greatest uh, market failure. So this is why the network was uh, established by the local government first. Why? Because those uh, representatives, community representatives, see the results, the threats of the climate change. So it's, uh, this network is already 25 years uh, old, almost in December will be. And it was initiated by uh, American and Canadian uh, city leaders uh, when they developed the, co uh, the concept and the Congress in 2000, I mean, tw 1990, uh, which brought over uh, 200 representatives of local government from 43 nations, started the official charter uh, of this and the strategy to combine, to reduce the uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, as well as to prepare the cities to the effects of climate change. So they changed the name 2003 uh, to Local Government for Sustainability, but uh, this is still a very important organization, over uh, 1,200 members from 84 countries with the headquarters in Bonn. Germany. So half of uh, these organizations are uh, located in the United States. It, it was the type of reaction of the inaction of the U.S. government. So it was not only market failure, but also was governmental failures to mobilize. So we have double failure. But uh, citizens didn't uh, agree with uh, status quo. This is what we discuss, the issue of inactions, the cost of inactions. And then uh, if we take into account that these uh, 600 members, uh, United States members, uh, represent about uh, or over 30% of U.S. population, it's quite significant power. And they had uh, ambitious goals, uh, objectives, and uh, targets. They mobilized the communities. I am one, I am from Seattle, one of the founding member cities. And then uh, we have over 20 years uh, the climate change policies because we see the molting. Uh, 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 glaciers and uh, we depend a lot on uh, hydro energy and then we want to combat and then adjust. What is interesting that uh, this is not just you know the, the pledge 
to reduce. But uh, as we discussed, and uh, Janani was talking about raising the standards and, uh, and um, regu norms, this uh, organization uh, sets certain standards and methodology of measurement, of monitoring pledges and measurement of performance. So this is not just a declaration, okay, well, I'm a member of this organization, but to be a member, you need to perform. They set the milestones. Uh, they start with conducting the greenhouse gases emission inventory and the forecast, and adopt the emission targets, and develop a secure form of approval for climate change actions. Very interesting that uh, this is also type of cross-sectoral initiatives. There are not only public leaders, there are business leaders, and sometimes they took the lead. There are a lot of uh, voluntary actions taken by business to, to reduce the actions. So we see Boeing, for instance, uh, made a commitment with the uh, Puget Sound transit to reduce the commuting by better uh, a flexible time schedule for employees and uh, developing extra network of buses to deliver, to give up, and then uh, to pay for parking space. <laughs> so the, the demand control action. So, I mean, this is a good example of collaboration. And so they implement the plans, policy measure, and measure the progress. What is important that all these practices are shared on the network. So the other cities are implementing and then sharing this. So the network serves as a great channel of distribution of the success stories. Another uh, network is the, uh, oh, by the way, the Clinton, uh, the working network was good enough to, to get support also from some foundation, including Clinton Foundation. I will talk. Uh, Briefly, but in general, I mean, they had the targets to reduce by 2020 1.36 billion metric tons of climate change, you know, uh, and by the 2050 6.8. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that if we will reduce, achieve these goals, we will stay uh, within the relatively secure uh, margin of 2% increase of the average world temperature. What is interesting uh, that uh, I measure the results, I mean, uh, in the United States, uh, in the, um, because United States is one of the countries which uh, signed the Kyoto Protocol but didn't ratify it. So the cities took the responsibility for the government, and uh, at the, uh, 2010, so two years before the commitment of uh, reaching the targets of uh, seven percent reduction, I uh, checked that uh, uh, the, the cities in the United States they cut. 31% of the, the target. So, you know, even, so somehow uh, not big, not universal city movement, but these 600 are making significant impact on the country. Again, uh, so uh, the, there is another network of the cities uh, the world uh, largest metropolis, there are 20 of them, and they created the organization, they invited 20 other uh, important cities, so they created the network C40, um, initially run by the mayor of, uh, of uh, London, uh, who became famous uh, introducing the congestion pricing which cuts significantly pollution in London. 
And then later, uh, I guess until uh, these days, uh, until recently, it was by Michael Bloomberg, who also introduced a lot of uh, climate change policy in New York. He failed by one vote in introducing congestion prices in New York, but uh, he built the awareness about the climate change. So, uh, because of the successful uh, uh, um, performance of this organization, the Clinton Foundation uh, significantly contributed uh, to the activities of those cities. So, in other words, you see the, the network, another network of big cities, the, the, the big cities, in general, in the cities, we produce like 80% of uh, greenhouse gases emission. So this is the, the right target, and the, the biggest cities produce the largest amount. So this is a good target. If we want to reach any policy uh, target, we need to focus on those which are the, the most significant. So anyway, uh, so this is exactly interesting collaboration of, of the um, networks and the business and the non-profit uh, sector like foundation. So in the United States, the, the, the many regions uh, were not uh, passive in terms of responding to the climate. The regional initiatives were established. It's very interesting, you know, uh, if you remember the map uh, Gary was showing, uh, the division between south and north, and you see similar division, almost a copy of the division <laughs> from the uh, civil war in the United States. Isn't that interesting? Those countries marked here, they created the uh, regional initiatives. Uh, they started in the east, uh, regional greenhouse initiatives, uh, and uh, north, uh, east, uh, New England, and so on. Then, you know, we have the western um, climate initiatives. Uh, there are some observers, uh, and uh, this is very interesting that uh, we have also Midwest the Greenhouse Reduction Accord. So we have several type of network, collaborative network in the states because they see the negative results for their states and they see also the opportunity to boost new technologies, new businesses. So anyway, what is interesting, you know, that uh, this network because of the performance or promise is spread out over the, the continent of uh, North America because uh, Canadian provinces shared except Alberta, which is the <laughs> greatest polluter and producer of oil and gas in Canada, but also the uh, several Mexican uh, provinces uh, took the uh, observer um, status. And so the, the, uh, they should spread out uh, uh, worldwide, you know. So, I mean, this is an example of the network, you know, sharing practices, they are using the, the own standard, there are stronger and uh, weaker organizations, but anyway, so the not network uh, of our climate change are good examples of uh, coordination without hierarchical structure. They have management, but the management structures are operational, not, not the power. Uh, they are making uh, the democratic decision. So the, the cluster uh, phenomena is uh, quite old, and then we, we see the first clusters in some time appearing in uh, medieval time in Italy, the shoe industry. Somebody was talking about shoes yesterday. And the design industry, the fashion industry, they are good examples of this. In fact, you know, one of the gurus of, of the, the industrial clusters, Michael Porter, uh, did his uh, research, his research in Italy, uh, observing the development of the, the cluster, industrial cluster. <laughs> so there are not only geographical concentration or interconnected uh, companies, suppliers, um, distributors, 
service providers, but also, I mean, the, the academia, the research in these days, and all type of associated institutions like, you know, setting the standards, financial institutions. So um, they are working in the particular field. Uh, so there are more, much more, clusters are much more than the supply chain because they include also the research consulting training. This is what we saw in, in Italy, in the given kind <laughs> training issues. And uh, delivering prof uh, um, professional services. Why we are talking about the, the original uh, concept of Porter uh, with uh, what are the benefits? So they, they increase productivity by innovation, spreading out through the network, innovation, spillover, innovation is that type of uh, public good. And then uh, cluster also uh, share information, the signal market opportunities appearing. They also reduce the risk associated with cooperation, with the uh, contracts. If you know your neighbor, you know next door, you serve on a school committee, you don't take, this is not big risk, to, you know, to, to make business with him, her, you know, because there is also strong peer pressure to perform. So anyway, uh, this is uh, interesting stuff, and then uh, uh, I started working on the cluster from 2005, Eric Andreoli is one of my collaborators, and then as a part of his PhD, he mentioned the type of three different levels of, of uh, uh, cluster development, from functional, in which we have just the simple uh, collocation of different companies, different organizations in one place, so he called the functional cluster through clams, which the, some of the companies are linking together, starting collaboration to working cluster he calls when they build the synergy or cooperation. They start working together. So I, I this is the, you know uh, his graphs. So the cluster initiatives we see in the United States worldwide uh, movement. The cluster, uh, the, 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 the cluster initiatives have the Competitiveness Institute, which is 16 years old already. So the, this is an interesting network. So you see the integration growing uh, from functional cluster to clumps to the working clusters, which uh, create uh, optimal benefits for regions and for the firms. I will come back. What is the, this is the, the, the graphic stuff, what is the facilitator of this movement from functional to working clusters? We believe that the major facilitator is the social capital built in the cluster, which help to cooperate, which build the synergy and uh, facilitate the spillover of positive externalities, so knowledge spillovers, innovations. So, but I will talk more about that uh, in, uh, in uh, my lecture, my, my second lecture on social capital. But if we look uh, at the, the, these two networks, I mean, and then I, I should say that the, the cluster uh, became an important uh, issue in European Union uh, since the beginning of this century, but uh, uh, because of effective application of this initial concept, first, I, I think that the pioneers of cluster uh, applications our Basque country and Catalonia, and in general, the Spain, and then Scandinavian countries. If you look at the, uh, so, I mean, these are the most competitive uh, countries. 
Why? Because they, they build certain synergy which help to improve efficiency of resources. So I will talk uh, more about that. But from that point of view, uh, if we look at the, 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 the industrial clusters, uh, those perform better which have established type of associations and certain rules and roles. So, from that point of view, I regard uh, the clusters, the networks, as, uh, as uh, institutions. So, clusters are examples of institutions. Of course, institutions are formal and uh, informal. You know, those uh, the clusters became associations or like these uh, networks of uh, cities had charters rules, monitoring mechanisms, so these are the real institutions. So uh, I brought the idea of the, I define the institutions and then we as a reproduce social practices, period. So they are formal and informal. The family is, is an institution. Language is an institution. Uh, and uh, the basic institution, uh, Winston was talking yesterday, the institution, the constitutions, which is not only the rule, but this is constitutions designed about making the rules, <laughs> the rule of making rules. So, I mean, and uh, we regard, uh, I regard these uh, institutions as patterns of institutional human interactions carried out in the repetitive uh, action. So institutions are not from God, but from the human being, you know, the, the need for uh, collaboration, need of survival leads to establishing of uh, institutions. So mainly institutions are, you know, have the history of control, I mean, the rule, norms, standards. Okay, and then, uh, I mean, it's the subject of many uh, sciences, not only economic, I think, the behavioral sciences, the philosophy, oh, we don't see the power, oh yeah, uh, Roberto is here, is a philosopher, public administration and the public and business administration, political sciences. So when we, yeah, uh, this is in the, the slide I uh, show often, uh, and this is what I wanted to mark it, uh, my favorite colors. This is the uh, pyramid showing the basic relations which shape human behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the, the, the incentives, action, reaction, and then if the incentives are lasting longer, if they are institutionalized in forms of the rules, laws, they shape the attitudes. And then if these rules and laws are embraced by the people, they identify with them, they feel legitimate, they became the values. So this way, they became the element of the culture. And this is very important. I think that, that this is something what, you know, brings us together. So, uh, of course, there are many definitions of institutions. I like the, 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 um, the institutions, I mean, the, the, the Belak, um, formulation as a pattern of social activities that shape the collective uh, and individual experiences and they show the place for individuals or what is possible or what is impossible, the uh, way of behaving uh, in relation to others. Uh, they also assigning the responsibilities, uh, they uh, demand accountability, provide the standards, and so they, they create the venues of individuals to develop, to grow up. 
So, and then when we are talking about institutions uh, in the designing process, we need to keep in, in fact the following elements. This is what I was working with Professor Bolan and then we developed this uh, type of features uh, when we applied this experience in Central Eastern Europe. So we need to uh, ident identity, you know, that you cannot impose institutions from the other countries. So one of the problems, for instance, uh, uh, this is my hypothesis, unfortunately we don't have any body from Germany that uh, imposition or extension of uh, institutions from West Germany to East Germany create a type of negative reaction, you know, which really put the, the country, a significant part of the nations, in a passive way, contrary to the other uh, countries of transformation when they were very excited to build new institutions. They were struggling, they were fighting, you know, but they felt attached to the institutions. Privatization laws, you know, the, uh, reforming the um, uh, code of labor and so on and so they. In the case of integration of Germany, they didn't need to build new institutions because they already existed there in democratic countries. So the issue of identification is very important and ownership and attachment. If you build the institution from scratch, you are attached to them. Then they, the institution should help to exchange the views, gives the way, a forum. They should encourage competition and cooperation. We need both. We need both. To be efficient, we need to compete. To resolve larger problems, we need to cooperate. And the institutions, uh, good institutions should have also significant uh, dose of altruism, devotion to joint, collective, good, and then good institutions have strong bonding. Uh, from the economic point of view, not only economic, but uh, I see this much more than e economics, but as an economist, uh, I follow uh, my master, Professor Hurwicz, uh, basic criteria of institutional sustainability. To have sustainable institutions, you need to have strong incentives to be a part and support and uh, obey the rules. And the institutions should be efficient. If they are not efficient, if they are costly, people will reject, will obey, uh, will avoid uh, following the rules. And uh, the answer is very important. And, uh, uh, which always emphasized the, the issue of subsidiarity. So making a coordination, uh, allocation of resources, coordinate allocation of resources at the lowest potential level. Not central, you know, everything in Brussels or in Moscow. I, I remember still the picture of the last uh, Soviet government with 110 ministries and uh, ministerial agencies, you know, huge apparatus, millions of people working for. And then uh, the shortage of, of goods and services and uh, discrimination. So if we build institutions, we should test them, you know, verify. Do they build loyalty to the institutions? Do they inspire creativity, bring, empower people? Exactly, this is what Gary, Giannani, or Alberto was talking. Do they provide perceived fairness as a, a justice in terms of the conflict? Or do they provide also the mutual help? Do they provide the social safety net? So designing institutions is not uh, the simpler way. Uh, Leo Hurwicz described this as a game. 
to be devised with rule providing by appropriate mix of cooperation and competition, by which people are acting in their own interest, behave in such manner to enhance or minimize the damage, for instance, for the environment, because we are working on the environmental issue, or to, to provide damage to the public goods, and the other resources. So this is, this is the, the aim. We, one, we can do our best in design institutions, but the, the final result has a big risk. This is why I can apply the game theory on this. So, uh, so anyway, when we design institutions, uh, we need to remember to build in incentives, to give the uh, opportunity for socialization, discuss, uh, to get participatory uh, uh, opportunity to, to, to introduce, to, to, dis to build the best model, you know, to get the participatory democracy to work. They need to be to be linked with legitimization. We, uh, you know, the, the government. We I used forty years under the uh, central planet communist rules. You know, so uh, one of the basic rules were bending the rule because the rules were not. We did not identify with them. And uh, we did, the government didn't have legitimacy. So, and uh, we are not socialized, we are not consulted uh, by establishing the rules. So they need to have the uh, monitoring and enforcement, and then they should have the uh, measures of conflict solutions. So, and then the, the final stuff we last, uh, I mean, uh, we, I am very pleased that to be a part of the team uh, led by our colleagues uh, Raul Weiler and Yuri Engelbrecht uh, on uh, new sciences and particularly social networks. We had the workshop and then uh, we, in this workshop we came to conclusions that uh, I mean there is a almost exponential growth of publications of networks. We have the four major models of networks. Uh, regular uh, latest model, in fact the first one was before, developed before Second World War by I think, and Hans in 1944. So, but I think the most popular was the random network uh, by Hungarian uh, uh, mathematician uh, Erdős uh, Rényi model. And to some extent, his student, also the Hungarian descent uh, from Transylvania, in Romania, uh, uh, Barabashi developed BA model, which we are trying to apply in our research, both in Poland, in aerospace cluster, and in uh, uh, Washington State, which have the, the largest. When we will meet next time, within a few next months, I hope I will be able to, to share some, quantitative, some results from very sophisticated quantitative uh, model with graph applications. Very sophisticated mathematics. And then we have small word uh, model about uh, what's uh, Strogatz algorithm. So anyway, we are getting better and better equipped to analyze the networks. We see that there are uh, certain uh, um, differences between strong and weak links. We see the certain uh, level of resilience and robustness. We measure this. We, we, we learned, for instance, paradoxically, that uh, for the information dissemination, the weak links are better than the strong links, because strong links tend to close up. 
and we see that uh, there is no type of contrary to random network. We see that uh, certain nodes where the uh, particular elements of the network are connecting have more power than the other. They became the hubs. We see in the case of aerospace uh, clusters, such hubs are the, the cluster organizations. We, in microeconomics of competitiveness, we call that uh, institutions for collaboration. And they linked, you know, with the all uh, measures, but also the major, uh, the final uh, good producers like Boeing, you know, Airbus, you know, they, they have this hub <laughs> link with the other. So uh, there is certain uh, different distribution of power, <laughs> you know, in terms of uh, measures. So it's not such a randomness. So interesting, you know, I hope to, to be able to share uh, with you uh, more results from the um, network uh, research on aerospace cluster, what we are conducting. But uh, at my next lecture on social capital, I will summarize the results of the two first stages, which are strongly linked with the social capital. So uh, I'm very sorry for the technical uh, break uh, out of my uh, lecture. But now I am ready for your tough questions, comments, and complaints. Thank you. Ivo, uh, uh, not really a question, but just a, a comment. Uh, uh, of course, the network, let's call it now the network theory, is extremely important. It actually starts uh, with the work of uh, uh, Euler, uh, who, when he was in Kennisburg, uh, who put this question yeah, of famous yeah. how to cross uh, seven yeah. ridges yeah. without repeating this. Uh, and so basically the network theory could be considered as a normal part of mathematics mm. because it's actually topology and yeah. so on. So you can do it. It is a tremendously important thing. The World Academy approached this uh, with one or two of our uh, colleagues. Uh, but I would strongly suggest you should mention, I think Albert Karabach is now professor at uh, Dr. Dane. He's a young man uh, and uh, I mean, you know, very talented. Uh, yeah. and, uh, uh, so potentially a very good person to get involved uh, yeah. into, into this story and tell that. To tell you another personal story, actually, when I was working uh, for the United States military back in the 70s, at that time there was a question how to protect uh, uh, various electronic components in the case of nuclear attack. Okay? So we were trying to get this hardened, 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 and so on. And then, of course, parallelly came the view that much better than doing that stupidity, hiding and covering and so on, is if you go to the network. Because with the network, of course, what you can have is you can cut several of the connections, but nevertheless, the system works. So this is an enormous part that we, uh, very, very important to use the word, but maybe you should go more and more than you will, the word resilience. Resilience. resilience is the name of the game, so that is very important. Thank you very much. I should mention Euler, one of the most uh, genial mathematicians, and then uh, exactly, and this is, he said, the uh, uh, foundation for the graph uh, theory, and then uh, we have another mathematician uh, Carlos. Uh, uh, this is Carlos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So but, uh, 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 yeah. You were but, the USA. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, I mean, uh, it is very so to, to the heart of what we do in, in masks. Basically, we, we try to use techniques of network theory, not only network theory, but describe a real world of existence, in particular yeah. in transport and energy and urban mobility. So, one, congratulations for your presentation. It's, it's also close to my heart in the sense that I agree very much with the idea that 
uh, inside the, the usual tools we have, that is uh, the state and, and the markets, yeah. and, uh, something new, something uh, really qualitatively different. Exactly. As uh, ways of coordination, coordination. Who, uh, uh, emerge from this idea of of, yeah. of using of using networks. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned the vast country because I agree it's, it's a very good uh, case of of study where industrial clusters uh, work very well based on a, on an ancient culture. So it doesn't emerge like that from now. Yeah. So that's a, that's a, that's a, yeah. For instance, this experience in the past country is quite unique in Spain. You mentioned that before saying that but it's not true that it is uh, true in, in Spain. No. <laughs> yeah, Catalonia uh, was close. So that was kind, but actually, it's not really in Catalonia, but, in, but the, the real place where it works, because there is a long tradition of association, of cooperation. Uh, between uh, small medium companies and and and, uh, and, uh, and an intelligent role of the of the state, of the regional government, uh, to have that to incentivize, not not to not necessarily to control yeah. and direct things, but just to create the conditions so that uh, networks flourish. And the last thing is that I, I'm very much interested in what you are doing. With Scale-free model. Uh, okay. We, we know myself and know myself any longer because some of them, my people are are very eager. One of them is the works with Barashi. So. Okay. So, so you know about that, right? Yes. Yeah. We should establish this contact. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then probably we should have the follow-up workshop on networking Absolutely. with uh, Albert, oh, yeah. okay. Albert and Carlos. Yeah. Yes, Mura. Maybe to continue but more in the social direction is uh, the question of uh, strength, of the social and political strength. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think uh, there is still no relation of that, uh, how much they actually work on in the political space. Mm -hmm. And that uh, the recent experience of the Arab Spring actually mm -hmm. shows that the networks, the, the social networks mm -hmm. in the uh, internet, that uh, they were one of the basis mm. for uh, the revolutions in, in mm. North Africa and also very important in the Middle East now, mm. uh, especially yeah. in, uh, around Iran, Iran and the uh, Islamic countries. Yeah. So I, I was, I'm not sure uh, how to put the question, but rather uh, I think we need the relation uh, of the social and political uh, strength and developments of networks and such. Yeah. Well, my, my response, uh, you will see at uh, my um, next lecture, I think that the critical element for sustainability and effectiveness of the um, network is investment in uh, social capital. And then you see uh, this is the, the major uh, glue which keeps the, all participants in the net together. But it is an investment. As an investment, you need to sacrifice something for the benefits in the future. This is why, you know, I mean, I don't want to tell more because you will not come for my next lecture. But uh, uh, I think that one of the, the failures or the weakness of the networks, if you have, there is not sufficient investment in social capital, not sufficient developed norms, rules, and then uh, they, they do not survive. You need to provide the fuel, and the fuel for a network is the social capital. So then I have, don't expect me to, to go deeper because I want to really leave this for Friday. For, for next, uh... Yes, Albert. So you, you create such <laughs> yes, exactly. A question from somebody ignorant of the economy, but uh, from you know an ignorant point of view, it seems that, that uh, there is a, a basic network, uh, and that's the human brain. 
in the human brain evolution. Then uh, that uh, everything uh, about uh, humans, uh, but I would say everything about life, uh, is uh, a network. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that we have a network science, uh, but uh, we are everything uh, is network, uh, from the atom to the galaxy. And so, uh, I like very much that you underline human capital, but it's also human capital is relationship. You know, yeah, this is that. Yeah. The name of the game is relationship. But being a uh, mental health, uh, <laughs> the relationship, uh, it sounds a uh, nice word, but uh, also uh, Nazi German uh, was a very efficient uh, network. Uh, as much as a very efficient network is the non-profit organization and the solidarity. Another very good network is uh, uh, the underground uh, uh, Christians uh, in uh, Imperial Rome. Literally, you can still visit in Rome uh, caves, uh, intricate network uh, that were, you know, the incarnation of their being networked, even if they were risking to be crucified in the Colosseum and be eaten by beasts, wild beasts. So, in terms of, you know, from an obviously ignorant point of view, there is anything in network science that will give you the parameter when networks, uh, since it's human capital, are protecting uh, and promoting human capital and in another side, uh, other network, uh, which are the quality, that they would uh, attack and destroy human capital. Before you answer that, just because it could be part of the same thing, going on what Alberto said, what's the difference between the network as the way you have used it and the market, which itself is a network. It's a network of relations. But you're using it, I mean, the industrial cluster is a, is a clear, is a, is a model. Yeah. What's, when you talk about a formal network in different types, how would you distinguish it from the, the, the relationships in society or the relationships as we see in the market? Because you pose this as a third model. Yeah. Okay. A very good question. Well, we, you know, that uh, in market you have the there's a significant difference, and then you have the uh, to be uh, in the network. You need to meet certain criteria, to uh, meet certain standards, and then in the market you you don't have in the uh, in the uh, we are talking about. Free market, receiver, there are no rules. There's just transaction. So, I mean, we need to look from the extreme models, completely centralized economy and completely laissez faire. So, laissez faire is laissez faire. They are stronger, uh, you are stronger on the market, you are stronger. Uh, on the field that you have these processes of concentration of power and so on. You don't have this in the network. You need to have certain rules and then there is no hierarchy and then uh, there is no uh, the process of concentration of, of power because you don't have that type of in the market you could be penalized, you know, by getting bankruptcy in the uh, network. You might be only excluded from the market. You don't have that type of uh, consequences. But it's a good, good question. I will think about it. But uh, I think that there is a different uh, uh, organization uh, uh, than um, it doesn't have that type of hierarchy like, uh, you know, the, the, the government. But it has the, the certain rules and roles to uh, uh, to work, and then this is not for the gaining power over the other. So this is the type of flat organization, 
and then this is the uh, the way uh, in which uh, the uh, information are shared for free. These are not transactions, market transactions you, you pay for within the, you share the information within the network. In the Facebook, you, you, the, the, those guys are sharing the best practices and the same, you know, they share uh, within the uh, aerospace clusters. So these are not transactional activities in terms of uh, exchange information for money, and then you avoid the concentration of capital on, on site and uh, all these consequences with bankruptcies, uh, monopolies, and so on. So this is what I would uh, uh, say. I had uh, some other arguments, you know, but this is what came to my mind uh, at this point. But this is what I wanted to say. I mean, that this, I would define the social capital, I need to have more time, present the, the different definitions, you know, but I don't want to, to start this today because we won't be able to finish. But we have also positive and negative social capital. So you mentioned the Nazi organization, Mafia is another example. And then uh, which uh, you use the information just for the benefits of the members you are, you are close for the other. So, uh, but uh, network uh, performance depends not on human, but on social capital, on the capital invested in relations. Of course, the human <laughs> is important, <laughs> skills to, to facilitate this. But I will come back to, to clarify how economies define, you know, human capital and social capital. This is something what is important for us to, to understand, you know, because in different disciplines we different understand, you know, human capital for the economist is not human being, period. Okay, let's uh, take a couple of other Yes. Here. Roberto, yeah. then I would like a little bit on Igor's uh, suggestion. I believe him that Finland, uh, the, the magic uh, world, or uh, the, the, the conceptual, the concept we should make reference to is resilience. Uh, uh, this is what distinguishes robust uh, situations from what is uh, otherwise. The real problem is that during the past 40 years or so, we have understood quite a few things uh, concerning the resilience of individuals. We know pretty well uh, how to distinguish, how to make a difference between resilient individuals and, as opposed to individuals that are weak uh, in, in various respects. And we have some idea about programs we can develop in order to help people, individuals, to become more resilient. On the other hand, uh, we have understood very little so far about the resilience of community. We do not have ways, uh, or we have, let's say, uh, uh, we have still a lot of difficulties in measuring, for instance, the level of resilience of a given community. So I agree that resilience is the magic word in a sense, but we know so little about it, uh, the resilience of community that a number of question marks are in front of us. And I doubt that network theory alone will be sufficient for understanding the problem of uh, the resilience of communities. It's really a, a needed component, a needed theoretical uh, start. No, it's very like part of that. So the question became, what else? In which way should we eventually improve network theory or other things? in order to better understand the resilience of communities, to maybe states or whatever it is, networks or enterprises. I have a very simple answer. Oh, excuse me. Here. May I? Yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. I will collect. Uh, so we yes. Hear Excellent. Um, this new uh, way, which you recommend, it does some good. Uh, it seems to be 
privileged on the lie in of good law, good law from society, good law from institutions. Do you think that it would be workable without being enforced by way of legislation? It's what you see at the year. You know, buying in socially is not good enough, it's one component. Because what we have is global investment capital in the Bangladesh mm -hmm. who are not going to be very pro mm -hmm. this idea. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think that is an excellent question. This is what I, I, I am glad that you got excited about the, the mathematical and the formal side about that, but somehow you forgot my efforts to link the network with uh, uh, and the theory of institutions building. The network, if the network does not follow the pattern of institution building or institution design, it fails. It does not have resilience if people do not identify themselves, if they do not socialize. You cannot have good uh, legislation if people feel that this is strange, this is out of the interest or it's imposed uh, 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 by, oh, excuse me, uh, imposed by uh, some uh, interest group. We have serious problems with this, you know, in the uh, U.S. and in many other countries. So, uh, I mean, you, this is the, the whole elements, you know, identity, socialization, attachment, you know, competition and cooperation, bonding, and so on. I mean, I agree. If you skip this and then jump just to the uh, new network theories, you miss the main dish, you jump to the dessert. So, you know, you need to, if you have a sustainable network and a working effective uh, network, you need to follow these patterns of building the network. Human network, of course, they are not natural uh, network. You like or not, but, you know, this is the designing institutions and implementing building is the long process. You need to build relations, you need to build all these uh, uh, type of attitudes, you know, which is uh, necessary. One, one good solution would be very strong lobby systems, lobbying lawyers, which they have in lots of countries. So they go and lobby various forms of yeah. and levels of state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what we discussed, and then, 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 then the, the other day, uh, before you arrived, uh, I guess Janani who was talking about the, how transparency of political process empower people. You see, this is why we are fighting now. I just I sent another appeal this morning because they're not supposed to vote for the United, uh, you know, just to give the, uh, <laughs> the uh, corporation the uh, status of persons, which is stupid. Sorry for not colloquial. I think we have uh, uh, so, uh, two more. We have, just, we have just about five minutes, so we can keep going. Okay, yeah, time. this is. So, Winston, I've got this. The very general problem with the concepts like network and social network and market, state control, resilience, and so on. It seems to me that. Uh, if these things are, are, are going to work, then the question is, what are the criteria that tell us they work? Uh, in short, you can't avoid some problem of value uh, or common interest, if you like. Uh, is it status? That's, is it the cluster? Is it the network? Is it how do you get resilience to be resilient? And, and I suspect that at the back of all of this, we talked about the human component, but only as an abstraction. And really what we should be looking at is the human component as an active agent of participatory decision-making. That could be innate, or it could be good, but resilience is going to be depending on the quality of the decisions that people make about resilience. If you talk about resilience as an abstraction without some connection oh, yeah. to decision-making, that's a problem. So I, I, I'm just a little bit um, 
the islands in the, in the criticize the concept of human capital. I did not because say that. I, I, I only mean in the sense that an economist would look at quite different things from yeah, yeah. non economists. Well, maybe an economist would benefit from the role of the, the human agent as a decision maker. Uh, Karen Janini says transparency, responsibility, accountability, uh, appraisability, and so on. Uh, but that seems to be the, the challenge to all of these. Um, shall we say, um, emerging mechanisms to uh, improve uh, our understanding of, of, of sustainability and our performance. At the back of all that are finite human agents of decision making. Okay? Maybe they're your friend, maybe they're not, we don't know. But they live their own And what we'll moves them? Maybe it's selfish interest, or maybe it's an enlightened common interest. There will be a challenge there to put that as a fact. I think we have uh, Carlos. Uh, maybe I, I will elaborate more in, uh, in uh, the lunch time. Just, uh, just a sentence. Uh, one of the key differences between markets and what we are, and the kind of networks we are talking about, is that markets competition is the first value. While in, uh, in these networks, collaboration is the first is value. The, exactly. so, Thank you, Carlos. Exactly. So that's a key difference. We yeah. elaborate more. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Two brief comments. One following what Roberto said. I would say that each science is a tremendous simplification and impoverishment. Uh, because uh, you just view one very simple aspect, for instance, coming to physics, uh, when you are dealing with anything in electricity, you don't care to ask. What is the electron? That is part of the philosophy. So science is always by definition, and so is the network theory a great simplification. The other question is between the, the discussion starting with this maker. Uh, the problem with the word rule. We usually like to associate the word rule with something done by Hammurabi or by the parliament. There are, however, rules that emerge just out of let's say having thousands of uh, balls, uh, simple particles, uh, just their own configuration become a certain rule. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to look at that, whether in the case of the network, there are these, uh, so to say, uh, uh, coming out of their own number and structure rules. Uh, so this is, it would be good to have two English words, you know, not English, it's everywhere, you know, I think it's common. Excellent discussion. It's great. Thank you so much. Thank you.